Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have Atina Ahmadi as our first speaker. Uh, Atina Ahmadi is a software engineer at Google. Uh, she has extensive experience in uh, designing and implementing systems in C, C++, Java, SP, and Net, J GSP, Java Servlet, Android, SQL, HTML, and Hadoop. So we are super happy to have you here and welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, like, thanks for first of all being here this early in the morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Athena Ahmadi. I'm a software engineer at Google, and today I'm gonna brush up on like what we do at Google, and then tell like tell my story, like what like what did I go through to become here, and then. Oh, first of all, I need to say this is not an official Google talk. I'm here in my own personal capacity because for an official talk, there's like so many hoops that I don't go through. So, and then at the end, I'm gonna just give some tips that I think are useful because you guys are learning programming. Uh, so, what do I do? Uh, I'm a software engineer and ads quality team. What ads quality does is obviously from the name, it tries to improve the quality of the ads, and I'll talk about like more about that one later. And then there is this whole big infrastructure at Google that is the ad system, and our team specifically is just one small gear in that big system. So what is ads quality? Well, first of all, let's start on like, why do we even need ads? Because well, some people don't like them, obviously. Some people find them annoying. But we get almost everything else for free. We have like free search, free emails, free maps. Like, you know, even in Google Drive, you have like, a, I don't know how much, like, free storage, but they all cost money for Google. Like, there's cost of the servers, there's a land that these servers, because they're actual computers, they have to like be somewhere, there's electricity, engineers, my salary. But, so it all costs money, and most of the money comes from the ads, like not just at Google, everywhere else you go to, you've seen like, you probably have seen ads, and that's, so like, they're, in, they're necessary to keep the internet like free and accessible. So the idea is, we want good ads. A good ad is something that is a pleasant or positive experience for both user and the advertiser. Uh, let's say, okay, so these are like, we've all seen bad ads. They're sometimes they're annoying. Like if you go to a page, there's some of them even like block the page. You have to like find the little close button. Like sometimes it's not visible. You have to like go through it. Sometimes there's autoplay sound and video that's very intrusive. Or like sometimes when you when you want to leave the page, it like prevents you. So that is very that those are like category of very annoying ads. Sometimes they're disrespectful or inappropriate. Obviously, these are bad ads. We don't want like they don't provide a good Google user experience. Sometimes the ads are not bad by themselves, but they're not useful or like they're unrelated. It's like more subtle, like because the ad is gonna take some space in your page anyways. So like even the fact that they're there and if they're not useful, they're not helping you, that's also not a positive experience. But imagine you're, search, you're searching for a car and like, for example, you want, I don't know, Toyota. And then the ads show like dealerships. So like that's something, if you decide that you want to buy a car, then like if you see the dealerships, then you don't have to do another search for like now give me like Toyota dealerships. So that is what we call a positive experience. You know, it's good for the user because it reduces one, one of the searches that they had to do. And it's also good for, good for the advertiser because that's what you want and that's what they're, like you might click there and then like, you've seen that. So it's both good for the user and good for the advertiser. Like in, so keeps the internet free, also keeps the user happy. That's the idea behind you know, improving the quality of the ads. So more into like what, uh, so there are still some language uncertainties that you know, machines are not still that good at determining if an ad is good or not. For a lot of them they are, but like there are some. To give you some examples, if you're in San Francisco and you're searching for a bridge, you probably mean Golden Gate Bridge or Bay Bridge. You don't need a dentist. But like, you know, if you search for a bridge, it's like, you know, for a machine, it's like, oh, maybe you want this. But that's like, these are the uncertainties. Or like if you search for Seahawks, do you mean the football team or the bird and like based on the context. So these are the things that in general, machines haven't caught up to us yet. So what my team specifically does is we have people that look at the ads, for example, and look at the search, what do you search for the query and see, ah, is this a good thing or not? Sometimes there are some things that machines or like our machine learning algorithms miss. 
and then we need to see why. And so we use that input from people to determine if it's a good ad or bad. So that is one input to our this whole structure. So we try to improve it with a little help from the people and then what they think. So this way, like we're going to improve the machines to get, you know, so we're going to improve our algorithms to see, oh, okay, so maybe this is what they mean by this query. Or like sometimes it's even more, like, it's, it's subtle in a different way. Sometimes you read an article that, this is like, I think like read an article in Business Insider at some point. Like, you know, how the ads don't actually fit the article. Like, for example, there was an article about drunk driving and there was a beer ad next to it. So if you're the advertiser, you don't want your beer ad to appear like in front of a drunk driver. Or like if, for example, there is like about, I don't know, some crisis, for example, in Greece or like in some country, then you see travel ads. So they're like, ah, oh, do you want to spend your vacation in Greece? So like that's exactly not a, an ideal situation. Go on. I also, you know, like a close to the, like a murder or something, I'd be like close to the cross or like an ad for both of the right next to it. Yeah, exactly. The, the, those are really bad experiences. Like if you're the advertiser, first of all, if you're the user, that is very ta like tasteless. And then if you're the advertiser, you'll be pissed that your content appears near that article. So those are, again, like more subtle, because like, if you're just a computer, like stuff, simpler algorithms, like, ah, oh, toilet paper, it should be related to toilet paper. Or alcohol, maybe this person likes to drink. So this, these are like the subtleties that we're trying to like somehow figure out and like provide a better experience. Uh, so this, this concludes my part of like basically touching on what I do at Google and like what we work on. Uh, this part is about how I got here. What did I do? So I was born and raised in Iran. I got my bachelor's there in Sharif University. I personally, I liked, I started learning programming in high school. I started with Java and then like that was the only course that I would do my homework like really religiously and like, no, this is the one that I want to do. And then the rest were like, oh, homework. Then I came here to UC Irvine. I was a PhD, so I started as a P. PhD student, and then I ended up living with my master's degree, but like, that's a whole other story. I started an internship in a hardware company. I was writing software for them, but even in that hardware company, it was a little old-fashioned. The company is no longer in business, actually, but like, it was run very old-fashioned way, and like, for example, I knew something, I knew JSP. They was like, no, we want to install something in ASP. Go learn that. I was like, okay, you're paying me. I'll do that, I guess. So I went but then at the, end, at the end of the internship, they gave me a full-time offer. I was like, I kind of liked like, working instead of like, you know, staying in school. So I talked with my advisor. I left PhD program. But then what happened is also I got another offer from a... Because I didn't want to stay in the hardware company because it wasn't related, exactly related to what I did. And I got a good offer from a big, another big tech company. And I was like, okay, so I dropped out of... I dropped. I was ready to go. I had a goodbye party. I sold all my furniture. But what happened is like my visa didn't pan out. So I had to stay in the hardware company for another nine months. And then I interviewed at Google and ended up being here. But uh, it felt really bad. So what happened was because I already had the offer from the tech company, when the hardware company offered me a job, it was like I didn't negotiate my salary because I thought, oh, I'm not going to be here. Like, it's fine. I didn't negotiate my salary. I didn't negotiate anything. And then I ended up staying there for like nine months. So I think like what I learned was even if you think you're not going to be somewhere, just, you know, get the best you can do. Or even like when I was there because I thought I'm leaving, somebody was taking credit for my work. And I was like, I didn't mind because I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't want to go through that. I'm not going to stay here anyways. Sorry. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to stay here anyway. So like, um, my advice would be don't do anything like that. You know, don't leave until the very last day that you're going to leave. I had the offer in my hand. You know, like, it's not like when you get the offer, you're done. Like, make sure everything else is in place before you actually drop the ball. Because as I said, that Harvard company wasn't doing great. So they did like some layoffs. And the second wave of the layoffs, I got laid off. And because I was on a work visa, it was a very stressful situation. It was like, because like, I had to find a job in two weeks. I was lucky that I had already interviewed at Google and like, got my offer a couple of days after. But still, that couple of days was really bad. So what I, seriously, like, from my own experience, like, before you leave, don't, don't drop the ball. Take credit for what you do, even if you think you're not going to stay somewhere. It's just, you know, 
I don't know. Thing. You don't want to go through what I did, basically. Uh, I guess that's it. And I'm, look, obviously, I'm a lot happier now. <laughs> so it, what year did you join Google? Uh, I've been at Google about four years now. Uh, so I want to also talk about what I worked on my master's at UC Irvine. I think it was an interesting problem. So uh, what I did was short read alignment. So I'm going to talk about what it is. Basically, humans, you probably know humans, like the DNA, humans have like their DNA is about 3 billion nucleotides. There are four types of them, but I, I just want to look at, because my biology is not that great, to be honest, but I want to just look at it from a com purely computer science point of view. So let's say the nucleotides, we call them ACTG, and then the human genome is a huge string with four letters. So if you like, don't even know the biology, it's just a string with four letters. And then the, there's a reference human genome that came out of the Human Genome Project. It cost a lot of money because it was the first of its, like it was the first one, and like they use different me methods. But now, if you want your personal DNA, it's a lot, because we have the reference, it's a lot cheaper to do it now. So what they do is humans, like their DNA is more than 99% similar. So there's like this tiny percentage of difference that like forms all of our differences. So now that we have the reference, you know you're like 99% plus similar to that. And what you want to get, if you want your personal DNA, there are instruments that give you very, very, a lot of very, very short substrings, like smaller, like, this, like smaller parts of the big reference. And one of the things that's hot like these days is try to put those strings back in the reference, find where they are. Sorry. Is that a No, no, it's like now they're like 100, 200, but again, like compared to the 3 billion, like 3 gigs of data characters, it's, it's very small. But so what happens is like you get all these, you want to map them back to the string and you want to be fast. It's also, it's a lot of data. So you want to be fast, but you also want to process all this data. And like what I want to basically, uh, so now it's just cost a couple of thousand dollars. So if you have a couple of thousand dollars that you have no other use for, you probably want to get your DNA. But then, so like I just want to talk, so what we did here was, there's, there's like all these computer science challenges here, like, oh, where should, it, where does it match? Because it's not an exact match, there are differences. And there are many repetitive sections. You want to find the best match, and then you want to give them like, with like 90% confidence, I think it goes here. Like basically because these are repetitive, so like one point appears in like many of these short reads, you get a like good idea of like what the DNA is, but the problem was it's a huge data and like remember when we were working on this at the time like this we wrote this code in C plus plus and C. But we want it to be fast, so we moved from C like these are like the nuances that you need to know. Like I was learning a lot from somebody else that was working on my lab that it's like, huh, we want to do this. Maybe the C command is faster because C is like lower, uh, closer to the like, you know, core than C++. So let's use this in C. Or we, like I remember my advisor, we had the choice of like, calculating something or just calculating, in w calculating something every time or just calculating it once and then keeping it in the memory. And my advisor, I remember, said, like, you know, memory is getting cheaper every day. Let's just keep everything in the memory, get more, t like, make our software faster. But, like, memory is cheap, so people are going to, like, buy computers. Even, like, now, I, like, what is the normal RAM? Like, about 14, 16? I don't know, 8? So, like, it's a lot cheaper than it used to be, and it's just going to keep getting cheaper and cheaper. So we made the decision to say, oh, we want more stuff in the memory versus calculating it every time. And, that actually worked out perfectly for us. So uh, there are, like, what I wanted to basically say is, like, you know, for programming, there is not just computer companies. There are, like, a lot of opportunities in, like, medical field. Basically, everything, big data is the buzzword now because storage is cheap. Like, we can keep, and we generate a lot of data. So, like, there are a lot of fields that work with big data. Big data. My master was in bioinformatics. But, like, there are other parts of life sciences, like the proteins, they want to, like, decide the exact shape of it or, like, how they bind. And that's all, like, they get a lot of data, again, from our body and try to map it. So um, what I want to get at is when you learn programming, it's not just the computer companies. It's, like, it applies to a lot of other companies, like, like image processing. There's basically all, not, not every field, but a lot of fields that 
would need programmers later on if you like, you know, you learn what you're doing and then like apply it. <sighs> okay, I'm not that <laughs> fast. So I want to just add at the end, I just want to add a bunch of things that I think would have been useful for me to learn. It's like culture of writing a code. When you learn programming at the beginning, it's like you just want to get something done. Like you want to just write it as quickly as possible. But when you start working, you need to, like it would be a good practice if you start, like once you start learning. But then like, you know, write your code the way that it's, imagine it's going to be used, it's going to stay there for a while. Like sometimes like, yeah, I'm going to just do a quick fix here, quick hack. That's going to go away within a week. We're going to fix it in another way, in a better way. But in practice, that's, it, that happens so much that the code stays there. So don't, when, even when you write a temporary solution, imagine it's going to be there for a while. Or make it easy to read, because especially at work when you come back, I mean, like it happened to me so many times. Like I come back to my code two months after, and I was like, what did I write here? What do I mean? So like try to make it clear, like variable names that you pick, like pick really good names, or comment your code. And like respect the other person that's going to read your code. Like we say, we write the code once, and then it's going to be read m a lot more, many more times because you know you write it once, you're done. But then there are like different people who are going to read that. So try to make it clear. Comment if you need to, or like use like use simpler logic. And then try to. Well, you'll be embarrassed if it's a bad code. Like I sometimes, like at Google, we can see who wrote each part of the code. So like sometimes I'm looking at it, who wrote this? This is like not how it should be. And then I look and I was like, I, I look to see like who it is and I should ask them why they wrote it this way. Maybe there was a reason and it's me. Like totally don't remember why I wrote that code and why I wrote it the way it is. So like try to be respectful to your future self and other people who are going to read your code. And then keep up to date. Like there are, you can search best practices for this. Or like for me, I mostly now code in Java. But like keep up to date. There's like Java 8 came out a while ago. Try to like catch up on, you know, if you put dedicate half, even less than half an hour a week, it's more than enough. Try to just stay up to date. Like every once in a while, search what's good now or what's new in the, like what you're doing. And also work is a little different from school. In school, everything is like perfect and looks good and needs to be, but like they don't care about these usability. They don't like, you know, when you do your homework, you're not going to come back and read it again. But at work, you actually need to like come back, modify your code. So I guess that is, Anyways, that's all I have to say. So I think we have time for questions. Anybody has questions? Yeah, so recently there was a restructuration of Google, which is now Alphabet conglomerate and Google yeah. has remained its core business. Uh, so could you comment about uh, being in the core business of Google uh, versus your perception of moonshots? And yeah, to be honest, I'm not that high on the like, food chain to actually notice any differences. For per like personally, I'm like a software engineer in one group and I'm not usually for, like that's me. Personally, they're like, I don't care. Like, I, like, I get some project that I like, and I'm like, oh, I like this, and I'm going to work on this. But we still, OK, so it's a different company, but it's still under the same umbrella. So like, even for people that like Moonshots, it's still, you know, you know, they're still there. But like, personally, for me, it was like, well, I like my, I like my teeny tiny board of like, this pro problem that I have to solve, and I go and do that. But I don't know like, what it is. And again, I, I don't notice any difference. I'm not. I probably VPs and senior VPs would notice, but. I see, yeah, my question was more like, as the, the culture, or even like, is the culture that you perceive of Google the actual culture of Google? So now it's a huge enterprise. Maybe back in the day, it used to be more like a startup. Uh, well, honestly, again, like, even the culture hasn't changed that much. Like, I don't feel any different. It happened while I was there. It happened like a year ago ish, I guess, or two years ago. Anyways, like, it was two, three years after it was in. Like it hasn't changed that much. Within each team, you get enough, like enough. You know, you're like you can you get enough like real estate to move around. Like try to try to do what you want, and like and again like, and I guess every small group has it still has its own spirit. But I'm only at Google, so I can't talk for the, the whole thing. 
I can talk about my team. <laughs> but, so like, uh, my culture of my team is, hasn't changed, but I don't think it has. Anyway, sorry. Go on. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I just found it. Thought it was cool. cool. <laughs> Um, Google's quite famous for their interviewing process. Could you talk to everybody a little bit about how that worked for you? Uh, how that worked for me, it's, it's a very, obviously, like, I don't know, there's an, there's a, ph I don't know how much, like, so there's a phone interview process, first there's a phone interview, and then if you pass that, there is a on-site interview. So, I haven't done interview training because like some of the software engineers do interview training and then they start interview. So these are software engineers that interview you. And then a lot of companies, the people who interview you like are the ones that like sit together, make the decisions. But at Google, they write their feedback and there, there's another group of people that see their feedback. So they want to, I guess they want to remove the like, so and they want, so like it's another committee that like reads the feedback. So I guess this like puts, they want to remove some biases, I guess. So like it's the other, like another group that like reads the feedback of the interviewers and then decides. So I don't know, can, like, I don't know if you have like more specific questions. Okay. So I guess that's the main difference. Like the interviewers like don't interview. Um, like, would you say you have any like tips specifically for interviewing at, like software companies or like um, like what you do to prepare before an interview? Okay, so what I first of all prepare. <laughs> you need to prepare. It's not like you know you're gonna wake up one day. So one of the things that they care about is algorithms and programming. So you know, make sure like for example, I, w I was lucky that my in my grad school my project was also involved programming, but like sometimes. Some of my friends who are also in grad school, like they do research and they haven't done programming. So, like you know, refresh that. Like, be ready to code because they would ask you probably to code on a code on a whiteboard, like code on like some text editor or something. So, like, be be ready to code. Like, look at. I think like there are books and not all of them, but like maybe briefly touch on like okay, so this is like these sort of questions. So they would ask algorithm or data structure and programming. So like there are like very. This is like this very specific set of topics, like, you know, I don't know, dynamic programming is good, or like, you know, you need to know data structures, or you need to be able to, again, like, code. So these are, I mean, these are the things that you need to know, kind of. And then, like, there are, I think, books and even, like, websites that have, like, examples. Just look at those. Don't dedicate a whole, a huge chunk of time, I guess, but, like, just see some sample examples, like, yeah, this is something that they might ask me. And from my personal experience, before my interview at Google, I looked at some of the samples. I was so scared because they were so hard. And then I was like, oh, I'm just going to, like, I'm not going to be able to do it. This is going to be so hard. I'm not going to even answer one question. But that wasn't the case, though. So. They're usually also, like, when you're interviewing, listen, because the interviewer tries to push you in the right direction. So, like, you know, like, what I, like, list, kind of, like, listen what they say or, like, their, like if they they're giving you sometimes if they see like you're in the right direction they kind of try to like a little push you and see how you're doing so like listen to that but I guess that's it. Yes. My uh, idea of a lot of American is not that um, most women grow up to be computer programmers. Um, am I wrong to be surprised by that? What, what's it like? So half of my class were women, undergrad class. Sorry. Half of my undergrad class were women. So I think it's like more proportionate than here. Because like in grad school, it was like, oh, there are not that many women here. But like in my undergrad, which was in Iran, there were like a lot of women there. Again, still there's like, uh, I guess still there's this culture of like, yeah, women are not good in math or they're not good in computer science. And I don't know, sometimes I feel it's more here, honestly. <laughs> like the movies, with, like the teen comedies. So they, like, I was watching, I was like, oh, why are they like, I don't know, the good, like the heroines are like, yeah, it's cute to be bad at math or bad at programming. So I find it like more of a cultural thing. Again, like there are still some majors that are considered more masculine, like mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. But computer science, luckily in Iran, is not one of them. Like, again, half of my class were women. So. 
I think in general, again, it's not 50-50, but that's what I mean. Yes, no. All right, thanks so much.